Hello, everybody. My name is Ken Kent. I'm the founder of Sign World 32 years ago. Uh, I'm still with the organization. Uh, welcome to our webinar today. Uh, we're going to get right to it. We have uh, four Sign World owners on the panel. We're waiting for one more to come on camera. And each one of the owners will introduce themselves one by one and tell you a little bit about their business. And then we will open it up to questions. Uh, we like to go uh, in order. So Jerry Wanser, you'll be first up, Jerry, followed by Jim Pershing and then Jeremy M and so on. So when it's your turn, have your questions ready. Uh, make it simple, make it open-ended. Uh, uh, easy for the panel to understand, and then each one of the panel members will answer your question one by one. You'll get four answers to each one of your questions. Um, we should have plenty of time to get through everybody, and then once we've gotten uh, through everybody, we'll go back around and or at any time in the chat at the very bottom of your screen, you can type in a question anytime you wish. Uh, and then we'll uh, get to those uh, toward the end. To my panel members, um, try to keep your answers uh, on point and short and succinct. We do have a lot of people that have a lot of questions and we don't want to run out of time. Uh, before we start with the introductions, or, well, let's do the introductions first and then Jack, you'll give us a couple of definitions. So, Michael Ryan. Tell us about your sign company. Yeah, Michael Ryan, I'm out of the Kansas City area, Overland Park, Kansas, uh, to be specific. Uh, we've been in business about five and a half years. Um, and the uh, company name is Forerunner Signs and Graphics. And how many employees are you up to, Michael? Uh, five of us. Okay, and how many square feet? Are you in your original space? Uh, we actually moved. I uh, still got about the same amount of square footage, though, uh, right around 3,000. Okay. And what's your sales goal for this year? Uh, well, it's obviously been adjusted a little bit, um, but uh, we should do 1.2, what we're projecting. Okay. And last question. Tell everybody what you used to do. Um, I was in the wireless industry, sales, sales management, and... Uh, actually ran a couple small wireless companies towards the end. Okay. Mike Butler in what part of St. Louis? Chesterfield. Chesterfield. West suburb. Introduce yourself, Mike. Tell us about your business. Landmark Sign Company. We're in Chesterfield, Missouri, which is a suburb of St. Louis. Uh, been in business for 10 years. Uh, got seven seven and a half employees right now and uh we're in about we're using about 3500 no, about 3800 square feet of space um and uh to uh, our goal this year probably is going to be one nine one nine five one million nine hundred fifty thousand you're not going to say two well Coronavirus probably knocked me off at two a little bit, but we'll go we'll go for it for sure, <clears throat> and be pleasantly surprised when we get there. And tell everybody what you used to do before you went to sign business. Uh, I was in the in uh, work for Monsanto in the chemical business in chemical industry, sales, management, marketing, bunch of different stuff. Okay, great. And Jack Werner, tell us your story. Uh, my company was called 3D Signs, named after three of my boys, Dennis, Danny, and David. I joined Sign World in 1995, ran my operation there for 10 years. I started in 1,100 square feet, ended up in 5,000 square feet with a staff of 11. I was at 1.3 million in sales in the days of the Yellow Pages before the internet. We were still more of a retail model than we were the, 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 the business park uh, production model we are now. I then sold that operation, joined Ken at the corporate office in sort of a partnership relationship. He and I worked together for about seven years. I finished buying him about five years ago and took over as president owner of Sign World. Ken has stayed on, has many roles, uh, but we've uh, relieved some of his daily duties and uh, continue to have him here. 
When I answer questions today, if it goes to my experience running a sign world operation, I'll speak from that perspective. If it goes to training and corporate policy and things like that, I'll answer from that perspective. So based on that, I'll go from one to the other. Uh, Ken, I see uh, Steve Cap has joined in. So, uh, and my, my, my uh, career before, uh, I was the general manager of a wholesale food distribution company. Okay. And Steve Cap, thanks for joining us. Steve, uh, uh, please introduce yourself. Uh, tell us about your business. Um, go ahead. Yeah, I'm, I'm Steve Cap. I'm uh, in uh, Castle Rock, Colorado, just a suburb of Denver. Um, been a sign world owner for a little over two years now. And um, um, we kind of do just about everything. Um, uh, not uh, too specialized in any one thing, but we do a lot of stuff. Okay, great. All right, well, let's jump into the questions. So Jerry Wamser, come off a of mute, Jerry. Go ahead, Jerry, ask a question. Good afternoon. Mike uh, Butler, I think you and I talked a couple weeks ago. Um, I have, I'm just curious on the new employee. I'm thinking about how I'm going to do that. Do you guys salary your, your employee, your sign maker, or hourly? Okay, so Michael Ryan, how do you pay your employees? Um, I've got uh, one on salary and the rest are on hourly. And Michael Butler, how do you pay your employees? All hourly. All hourly. Steve Cap. Yeah, everybody here is uh, hourly. Um, my salesperson also gets a, a commission bonus uh, meeting certain targets. And Jack Werner? Uh, I would say most sign world owners would be all hourly. The one exception might be your production manager, your general manager. Uh, when you did introductions, Steve, a couple more questions for you so people know where you're at. How large is your space? Uh, how many employees? And uh, what's your expected uh, revenue for 2020? And then also, what was your job title pr prior to sign world? Uh, so my previous title was, uh, at Cisco systems, I was director of it. Um, and, uh, um, this year we're expecting to hit about 600,000, um, in, uh, total revenue. Um, and I have, uh, currently I have four people working for me. Um, and, um, uh, one salesperson out of the four. Um, what did I miss, Jack? Uh, how big is your facility? Oh, uh, facility-wise, I'm at 4,000 square feet, um, about a 70-30 split between office and, uh, and manufacturing space. Very good. Got it. Great. Jim Pershing, come off of mute, Jim. James? Thank Go ahead. You. Hey, thanks, everybody, for... Uh, pulling this, uh, coming together on this. I appreciate, uh, appreciate that. Um, I'm in the very early stages of uh, kind of understanding Sign World and the opportunity to fran uh, as a business alliance partner. And I've had one conversation with Kent. Um, my background is I've, I've been in IT as a consultant, so I have no experience in, in sign making. And so my first question is kind of a general question, which is about the sign making market. I, I'm kind of interested to understand how you guys, um, you know, what are the market characteristics? And what I'm thinking there is, you know, is it a saturated market, mature? And how do you compete in that, that market, depending on how you characterize it? Are you competing on service, on price, on quality, or other characteristics? And then how does Sign World uh, help you compete in that market as, a, as your business alliance partner? Okay, Steve Cap, let's go right back to you, an IT guy. So your view of the market, how'd you break in? Uh, go ahead. Well, um, long and short, uh, you know, Jack twisted my arm and I, and I joined, uh, <laughs> but, but he did a convincing job of doing so. So, um, you know, I was uh, kind of forcibly retired out of, uh, out of the IT world um, and, uh, and that's what kind of brought me into this after a long bit of analysis. And um, uh, I think the market 
you know, is, is pretty robust. Um, and, uh, you know, you look at, uh, at sign making in general as an industry, it's a, it's a 50 billion plus dollar a year marketplace. And, you know, just getting 1% of 50 billion is a, is a, is a ton of money. So, you know, if you do a good job of, of selling and customer service and, and delivering good quality materials, you know, you'll get your share of the market without, uh, without any sweat. Okay. Mike Butler, 10 years in business, your thoughts on that. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of sign companies probably in every market. Uh, but there's a lot of sign business to be had. And, um, the fact that everyone who's on this call is on this call probably gives me confidence that your experience level is enough to give you, you know, an advantage over eight out of 10 of your competitors pretty quickly after starting. It's not that sophisticated of an industry. There's plenty of business to be had out there. Um, signs run the gamut, you know, way beyond what you might have in your mind is what signs are. So there's all kinds of things to do. Uh, we, we just keep our head down and do what we do. And I don't really pay attention to competition a whole lot. Um, but I, I, to answer your question, I would think that service is probably the key and, and the timeliness to, the, to getting back to people. The quicker you can respond, the quicker you can get in front of people and you know, give them attention that they need. I think that uh, that'll really differentiate yourself. And that's what we've, we've done and that's, that's worked. Michael Ryan, your thoughts. Yeah, I would concur. I mean, I've probably got 12 to 15 sign companies with a, in a three mile radius. You know, when I, when I started this company, I knew three people in the entire area. Um, so it's just about getting out there and, and letting people know what you do and meeting new people. And, you know, it's uh, kind of to Mike Butler's point, it's not rocket science. I mean, uh, it was actually kind of shocking and eye opening to me. If you're responsive and you're professional and you manage projects well, there's no reason you can't uh, be hugely successful in this industry. You know, you're you're up against sign sign guys running a sign company, and and I've found they're a lot like contractors not returning calls and so forth, and and we're business people running a sign company. Um, and then to the point about uh, you know nothing about you know, the sign industry, I had no clue. Um, you know, I just say hire people smarter than me around me. Um, and so I've filled those positions. Jack, what are your thoughts? I want to reposition the question a little bit. So while Michael and, and Mike had some sales experience, Steve none, would any of you say that this is a sales heavy industry or is it more of a consultative industry? You know, so when you're meeting with a customer, uh, Mike and Michael, is it your sales skill that's getting the business or is it just your understanding of a customer needs and consultative process because they already have the need for the thing. Uh, so Mike, Michael, speak to that first. Yeah, no, I, absolutely. It's totally consultative. Um, you know, you go in as the professional <laughs> and uh, educate your customer. And, you know, I, I've built this uh, business totally on relationships and, and it's not about trying to sell. It's about trying to help and listen to the customer. Mike Butler? Yeah, I would agree. It, uh, selling is its not a heavy duty, hardcore sale. You'll know more than your customers and you'll know what they need or uh, I enjoy it. I thought it'd be the thing I would like least. And I was most nervous about it. It's the uh, thing I enjoy the most. And it's, it's not that difficult. It's not really a high pressure, high performance sale. It's a relationship. Yeah, no, I completely agree. Um, it's a, uh, it's a consultative approach and, you know, quite frankly, it, it fit more of my skill sets uh, coming out of the IT world um, because that's a lot of what we did was, you know, a uh, consultative kind of approach. We didn't sell a lot. Um, the, we let the product sell itself. Sales is convincing somebody to buy something they didn't plan to buy. Our customers already are planning to buy something. We're talking to them about how we can help solve it for them. Fantastic. Jeremy M. Jeremy M. Come off the of mute. Good afternoon, everyone. Jeremy Mason here. Pleasure. Thanks for taking the time. Really appreciate it. 
I too am pretty early in the stages of exploratory conversations. Dan wanted me to attend. So I think the, uh, just a general question, as it seems like it's a pretty good business model, what type of support do you provide for the startup of the organization, operations, and marketing? Jack, you want to start? you're going to go through five weeks worth of training before you open. We're going to spend a lot of time on marketing because it doesn't do any good to have a business if you don't have customers. We're going to really talk about that. And we know that 90% of our owners have never done sales or marketing. From there, you're going to go into a two-year sales and marketing coaching program where you're on a video conference like this with about 15, 20 fellow students, starting with Ken for the first six, nine, 12 months, and then graduating to my class for the second year. So you're going to class every week for the first two years, trying to learn how to market the business, how to get customers. So uh, go to Steve Cap. Steve, how was sales marketing training for you? I thought it was excellent. Very comprehensive. Um, I learned a lot uh, um, the two weeks that we were, uh, uh, out uh, with uh, with your team and and, uh, and Terry Lee, um, and then uh, the additional sales training that we got, uh, you know, with Ken, with yourself, um, uh, over the, the last two years have been uh, very helpful. Um, uh, you know, good opportunity to reach out and and uh, ask questions even outside of the the normal classroom kind of uh, kind of setting. So um, appreciated the support that. Uh, Sign world's given me. Mike Butler, tell us about 10 years of sign world support. Great. I mean, um, early on gave you, gave me all I needed. I think all they could have before, you know, I got turned loose to experience stuff and learn through those experiences. Uh, the marketing training, you know, once I got started was, was so good that I didn't last very long. We were so busy. I couldn't, couldn't keep attending the meeting because we had so much business coming in. Uh, and then really the value to the network beyond the initial training is the relationships, the, the, the gathering, the, the sharing of ideas with other owners, you know, people that are doing the same thing that you are trying to do the same thing and learning from them and getting encouragement from them, commiserating with them. It's, it's, uh, it's really uh, a, a big benefit to sign world. Michael Ryan, your thoughts. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, you know, honestly, kudos to you guys for the, all the tools that uh, you provide on the, on the uh, front end, you know, sales marketing. You know, I remember the Excel spreadsheet that actually walks you through how to open a business, how to, you know, make sure you got the lights turned on in your lease space. I mean, it really, you guys really break it down and do a great job um, in training um, I probably got more information than I wanted at that point in time, uh, but it was phenomenal. And uh, the the support from corporate is is wonderful as well. But to Mike's point, I mean, especially early on, I really got the benefit of reaching out to other owners that I had talked through through my discovery process and really pick their brain and ask them how to do projects and that kind of thing. Uh, it's still ongoing that way. Um, and I always say you get as much help or as little help as you need. Somebody's always there if you need help, but you, you know, they're not going to be down your throat if you, if you don't ask for it. Okay. Uh, again, to the panel, we need to be mindful of the time. So do your best with shorter answers. Kim Bice, Kim, come off of you. Go ahead, Kim. Thank you. Uh, yes, I'd like to have some insight into your very first sales and customers. How, how did you acquire those sales and customers? All right, Mike Butler, let's start with you. If you can remember 10 years ago, who were your first, who was your first customer? And by the way, did you get this customer before you opened or after you opened? Go ahead, Mike. Uh, my very first customer was a banner. It was a guy that I knew uh, who had a restaurant. We got it before we opened because I remember doing it in a store of another person that I knew. Uh, beyond that, my first general, my first customers, uh, you know, that I can remember were, you know, largely through contacts that I had, you know, just letting people know what I was doing. Uh, they would introduce me or give me a name of people that they knew. And then I would contact them and, and, you know, 
get that warm introduction and, and lead and, and just kind of took it from there. Did you have projects to do day one? No, nah, I can't say that we did really. We, we uh, focused on opening and then uh, I kind of got down to it mostly after we started, after we opened. Michael Ryan, what was it like day one? Did you have projects before day one? Go ahead. Yeah, I, like I said, I knew three people in the city when I was starting this business. One of them was my chiropractor, and he was my first customer, and I had a project before we opened. It was actually about an $8,000 project for uh, illuminated routed panel signs. So, um, yeah, it's great. How'd you get that job done? Uh, well, we... Uh, subbed it out through the sign world vendor network and picked a lot of owners brains on installation and uh, made it happen. And were you busy day one? Uh, we were, we actually came in with uh, five projects lined up. Okay. And Steve Cap, what was it like for you day one? Did you have projects before? Yeah, we uh, um, started our web advertising um, 10 days ahead of opening and uh, we actually had uh, projects uh, lined up and ready to go for, for day one. And, um, uh, and we were pretty busy. And quite honestly, we've been drinking from the fire hose ever since. Good. Jack, your thoughts? You know, we did, well, we didn't do it so much years ago. Over the last number of years, we've really prepped sign world owners that once they sign a contract, every hour they're not in training and build out during those three months that it takes to get the doors open. They're trying to accomplish two goals. One, build a book of customers that are willing to wait so their sign maker starts busy. And the customers that can't wait, you're gonna outsource it through the network of other owners. Okay, Mike Lesky. Mike, come off from you. Go ahead, Mike. Yeah, thank you, Mike Lesky from Keller, Texas. Uh, as Mike Butler, we were practically neighbors at some point in time. I lived up in Wildwood, um, Chester, I believe it's near Chesterfield. Uh, so yeah. good to see you. Um, I think Kim just took part of my first question, so I think that's answered. So my second question was, uh, what type of signs comprise um, a largest percentage of your business? <laughs> and also, what, uh, um, what type of signs generally are the most profitable? Steve Cap, what type of signs do you do mostly and what's the most profitable? <laughs> Well, we've kind of evolved over uh, over time, where we're doing a lot more uh, architectural and ADA signage um, than what we did when we started. Um, so uh, we still do a lot of vinyl, we still do a lot of banners, uh, but I'd say the predominance is uh, uh, in laser cut acrylics and uh, interior signage right now. Um, Mike, uh, Michael Ryan. Yeah, we're very much a generalist, but I'd say the biggest ones are uh, monument signs, um, channel letters, and uh, routed uh, acrylic uh, interior dimensional and monument signs are quickly becoming a larger portion of our business, which I really enjoy. Mike Butler? Yeah, I would say on a volume basis, uh, channel letters, and we do a ton of monument signs as well. Um, we do our share of vinyl. Vinyl's, you know, typically the most profitable, uh, but the others are bigger ticket items and uh, you can still make quite a bit of money on them. So just for those uh, guests on the call who aren't as uh, aware of the technical terms, when you say vinyl, that's uh, a material that you print on, peel off the back and stick it on to something. So. You're sticking it on vehicles, Mike Butler, on glass windows, uh, where else? On uh, aluminum panels and putting them in warehouses, on corrugated plastic signs, uh, clear acrylic signs, lobby signs, things. Yeah, you could say big uh, Lexan panels for big pylon signs. Anything it'll stick to. Got it. All right. Uh, you can, in that vein, can somebody explain what a channel letter is? Sure. Michael Ryan, tell us what a channel letter is. Yeah, so um, if you look at exterior business signs uh, hanging on the building, uh, they're the illuminated letters, typically about five inches deep, uh, put on the side of the building. Okay. Each letter is a tin can. All right, uh, Steve Knopf, 
Well, uh, wait, Jack Werner, what? Uh, you know, what we, what we teach in training is to be the generalist in the beginning and let the niche come to you over a couple of years, we, either by the type of customer, by the type of product, or what fits your staff the best. Uh, from my background coming out of the restaurant world, the retail world, most of my customers were restaurant chains and retail chains. I went back to people I could speak comfortably with. Okay. Um, when I had my sign company, uh, it wasn't so much the product as the customer. So my largest customer was Bank of Hawaii, and I did everything for them. Indoor signs, outdoor signs, uh, branch signs, headquarters signs, throwaway signs, uh, trade show signs, everything. But whatever they wanted, I got it done. Okay, Steve Noth. Steve, come off of mute. You are. Go ahead, Steve. Good afternoon. I'd like uh, two questions. One is how long did it take before you got a salary, started earning the salary that you wanted? And how long did it take for you to break even? Okay, good questions. So, Michael Butler, how long did it take you to break even cash on cash on a monthly basis? End of our second month. And how long before you took your first paycheck? Month seven. Michael Ryan, how long did it take you to break even cash on cash on a monthly basis? Uh, cash on cash, three months. Uh, I started paying myself month seven. Month seven? Okay. Steve Cap, how long did it take you to break even cash on cash on a monthly basis? Three months and, um, and then started drawing salary at about month eight. And Jack Warner? Uh, one month and six months. Okay. Dave Scotto, come off of mute, Dave. Hello, Dave. Go ahead. Thanks, Ken. Appreciate that. Uh, I think a lot of my questions have been answered, but I'll uh, just take a stab at it anyway. First off, I want to thank everybody to for uh, inviting me to this panel. I appreciate Jack and everything he's done kind of get me to this point. A little bit about my background. I was a I was in manufacturing, printing manufacturing. I was a lean practitioner and eventually was the CEO of a, a manufacturing firm on the West Coast. And then I consulted in healthcare since 2004. And most recently was a VP with Baylor Scott and White Health in Texas. And um, and then last year we kind of uh, there was a restructure and now I'm doing my own thing. So um, my question is. Um, how closely or easy it was it to track to the the pro forma projections? I kind I think some of the that was answered in that last question. And how closely did you have to follow the system in order to get your results? Okay, Michael Ryan, uh, how closely? Uh, I I blew the pro the pro forma out of the water year one, two, and three. So. Um, I know just based on other conversation, I think it's pretty accurate and the rest is up to you. Michael Butler. Yeah, we I beat, beat the pro forma pretty, pretty handily where our mix was probably a little different than what was on, on the pro forma, but the overall numbers were better. Okay. Steve cap. Yeah, we, we blew out the performer too. Um, and, uh, um, you know, I, I, I think the, the, the real adage here is, is you get out of it what you put into it. I think Sign World sets up a, a great plan and program and you put more energy into it, that plan and program is gonna go with you. Jack Horner? You know, some people have a more aggressive plan, some have a less aggressive. You've gotta to put together yours based on where you think your skills are and expectations. Uh, compare it to others in the system. You're gonna to relate to some of these owners more than others. And then have Ken and I and Dan help you uh, formulated to make sure it's reasonable for you. Brent Russ, Brent, come off of mute. All right. Um, yeah, so Brent Russ, I also have an IT background, so there's something going on there. Um, went through a reorganization this last year, similar to what, what it sounds like, Steve, you went through. Uh, so now I'm evaluating opportunities. Um, my question really kind of goes back to one that was brought up, but I'd like to understand it a little better is the, the marketing side. So in terms of lead generation that sign world may help you with versus what you're doing on your own, the marketing programs, just a better understanding of how you market your business. 
Well, since we have Dan Werner on the call, Dan, you want to uh, give us a bird's eye view of that and then we'll ask the owners what they do? Sure, can you hear me okay? Yes, Dan Werner is our Vice President of Operations. Uh, he's been with Sign World almost 25 years. He's Jack's son and Dan handles uh, the website internet training and uh, part of it. Go ahead, Dan. Yeah, really from the from the digital side, the efforts put into that really start from day one, really at the point of signing a contract. Uh, at that point, we start web development for your unique brand, uh, working through some outside uh, channels to do that development. But uh, from the point of launch, uh, the website's launched roughly six to eight weeks before you officially open your doors to help speed up that process post opening of actually generating leads through your digital presence. And as you continue to utilize uh, the tools available to you through the marketing plan, whether it's traditional search engine optimization, it's pay-per-click advertising, it's social media uh, presence, it's uh, directory focus, there's a number of different avenues and channels that we uh, utilize. The goal is to help generate a lot of business, not only within your local area, but also help create scalability outside of that area. Uh, owners that are utilizing the, the plans and strategies uh, that are implemented today, typically what they find is anywhere between 50 to 90% of their new business coming as a lead generated through their website. So there's a lot of uh, aggressive channels that we leverage and utilize um, that give you an opportunity really to flex your muscle in any direction. And each of these three owners sort of take a different uh, avenue uh, with their web marketing programs, but a lot of it is still in alignment with what uh, we're doing and recommending today. And then the second side of that is just uh, much like you've heard the three owners talk about today. It's about the hustle that you put in the community and the neighborhood to also generate some of that immediate brand awareness while the web presence is, uh, is gaining that traction. Okay, so Steve Cap, what percent of your new business, not your repeat business, what percent of your new business comes from your website from the internet? Yeah, about, uh, I'd say 95% comes from the internet. Okay. Um, Mike Butler, not your repeat business, but your new business, what percent comes from the website internet? Probably 90%. And Michael Ryan? I'm running about 70%. Okay, and Jack Werner? I wish I had the, the internet, I had a yellow pages. Okay. And I'm gonna show a couple of slideshows in the background here. We're gonna go on with questions while we have these. To introduce these three slideshows, the first one just shows some locations inside and out. So you can see how unique and different they are. Second slideshow goes to what is a sign, not only what the initial equipment makes, but what the embellishment, but what you'll outsource. And third part of that slideshow is showing you just some signs that you wouldn't even think of as signs. And then the third slideshow is showing you our wall of fame, showing some of the bigger, more elaborate projects Sign World owners develop into. So we'll watch these while we're continuing with questions. So Ken, go ahead. I think Michael Moore is next on your list. Yep, Michael Moore, come off of mute. Uh, Michael Moore does not have audio, so I'll go ahead and ask his question for him. Um, can you speak to how have you transitioned from initial sign making capability to a more sophisticated signage? In other words, move to in-house versus outsource to other sign world members. Okay. Um, Michael Butler, 10 years. Uh, how have you moved from um, outsourcing projects to doing it yourself or vice versa? How has that uh, changed over the 10 years? Well, we, we don't really make anything other than vinyl signs and simple signs in-house. We outsource the rest of the signs that we, uh, we install and sell. But I would say that, you know, you, you know, we've evolved with who we use, how efficiently we do it, how much of it we can do ourselves. We do all our own installs, or at least as much as we can. So we've really evolved just through the uh, experience and learning process and, and trial and error and making mistakes and having victories. So it's just, you know, experience thing that it naturally kind of flows as your customers are asking for bigger things and you're able to take a little bit more on, um, uh, you know, all the time. You decide what you want to take on and then you can figure it out. Okay. 
Michael Ryan, how have you transitioned from the simple stuff to the more sophisticated stuff? Well, we, we actually launched with the more sophisticated stuff. Like I said, the uh, answer is yes. And then we go to the owners to figure out how to make it happen. So, um, yeah, I still outsource the majority of our larger jobs as far as uh, manufacturing and production through Sign World Preferred Partners. Uh, we, too, like Mike, do our own installations. Steve Cap, uh, you quickly transitioned from the simple stuff to the more sophisticated. Tell us about it. Yeah, well, uh, so after about six months in business, I, uh, I was offered to purchase another business. Uh, somebody was retiring, and um, I added in a lot of uh, equipment and capabilities and a, and a customer list of, uh, uh, you know, industries that I was not already covering. So it exposed me a lot to the hospitality industry, and, um, and um, uh, you know, we started building... Uh, more stuff in-house, a um, lot more manufacturing in-house. Um, we went beyond just the vinyl into, um, you know, building things with acrylics and metals and, and things like that that we weren't manufacturing before. So now we do most of our own dimensional letters and things like that in-house. And uh, things that we can't do, like uh, channel letters, uh, we'll uh, farm out um, as, uh, you know, it makes economic sense to do it. And then we do most of our own installations in-house as well. Okay, and Jack Werner? You know, I started off in the normal 75-25 in-house to subcontracted, probably moved to about a 50-50 as I went into bigger projects. And then I brought in my own CNC router, engraving equipment, uh, paint booth, uh, screen print press, and we were about 90% in-house at the end. Simon so is either going to go one direction or the other, either bring in the equipment or as others like Mike and and, and Michael have done of just have the suppliers to do it and they outsource it and take on the parts that they want. Jim Brewer, Jim, come off a of mute. Hey guys, thank you uh, for the opportunity to uh, listen to the ownership uh, speak about their experiences. With that, uh, two questions. Uh, what I hear is some very small staffs uh, that you have empl employed. Uh, what are you doing to attract and retain um, uh, good employees? And the second question is, what is the best and worst surprise you found after you became uh, an owner? Thanks. Mike Butler, how many employees do you have now? Seven. And how has it been uh, hiring and retaining, turnover, et cetera, 10 years? Um, well, we've, as we've, as we've grown and gotten more experience, we've been able to retain people. Um, we're, we're pretty good at, at that right now. Um, early on, I don't know, it's a little bit more difficult while you're trying to build your business, but I don't know that that's a function of anything other than maybe just not the right people. I mean, we just try and treat the folks right and make it a enjoyable place to work and, and, uh, been okay so far. I don't know what else to say. Okay. Michael Ryan, again, how many years in business? We've been in business five and a half years. I've got five employees. Um, you know, when I opened the business, I wanted to create a specific culture. And so I hire first and foremost for people that fit the culture around here. Um, and let's see, I tried a sales guy. I let him go. Other than that, uh, my employees have been with me since day one. Wow. Wow. Way to go, Mike. Five and a half years. Everybody should stay one except one. Uh, Steve Cap, your thoughts? Well, I have uh, four currently working for me. Um, my first two hires uh, um, are still with me. Um, and um, I've had some transition on the sales side. Um, and uh, uh, the current guy I have right now has been with me Gosh, uh, seven months now, uh, and um, uh, had some, uh, uh, you know, I, I kind of think that, you know, the way you keep employees is you, is you treat them the way you want to be treated yourself. You kind of follow the golden rule, and, and I think, uh, um, you know, we try to create a team atmosphere here, and, um, you know, we all work together during the tough times and, the, and celebrate the wins, so it's, uh, you know, I think it's just how you treat people to, to keep them on board. Okay. Jack Warner. You know, 
sign maker is, is a career, it's not a job. Uh, once a sign maker, probably always a sign maker. So if you hire carefully, treat them as they talk about family, treat them like you want to be treated. They're sticking around, uh, very low turnover. Uh, we'll give you the ads to place, tell you where to place the ads. You do the preliminary interviews, we'll do the in-depth interviews. Other sign roles will help you interview. Have them go work in another location, see how the job performs. Be careful on hiring. Hire slow and fire fast. Uh, people, you hire people for talent, you fire for behavior. Um, but very low turnover in the industry. And there are, there are people out there looking for this happy home. Okay. Clodiana and Sven, did I get it right? Yes, hi. Hi, go ahead. Um, actually, the question that we had um, was already answered, but it's, it, it's more like going, how easy was it to find the right candidate, you know, to support the production? I guess um, that, that's, how long would it take? It's like one week, five weeks. Um, I guess that's more like the question that we have at this point. Thank you. Could you uh, Sven, could you get closer to your microphone? And well, I apologize. Is, is that better now? Yeah, repeat the question simply. Yes, yeah. How easy was it to find the, the employee, the first one? That okay. Required? Steve Cap, how easy, how hard was it to find your very, very first employee? Uh, you know, I consider myself extremely lucky on my first hire. Um, I found him within six days, and uh, he was a thorough professional. He's the best guy I saw uh, coming in the door, and he's been with me ever since. And uh, Michael Ryan, how easy it, didn't know anybody in town, knew three people. How, how hard, how easy to find your first employee, Michael? Yeah, I too was really blessed. I found my first employee in the first week. He's my operations manager and uh, still here. And Mike Butler? Oh, probably took me two or three weeks, I think, uh, for my first guy who, who um, left to pursue another job in in the sign industry and i think now he's a sign world vendor actually okay and jack warner uh my first hire was a referral from a contact from previous business he, he stayed with me for three years and then my second hire was with me when i sold my business 10 years later okay Claudiana, do you have a question Yes, thank you. Uh, the question I had is like, um, does the sign maker closer only... to your speaker? Closer to your speaker. Yeah, sorry. Can you hear me better? Yes. So the question I had is like more in the does the sign maker just works on the graphics on the computer, or he also is part of the operations and working with the materials? Would he have that experience as well? Uh, okay. Uh, the answer is yes. You're looking more for the production employee than you are for the creative graphics person. But yet you want someone that's both. Uh, Steve Cap, tell us about your first employee's production and graphics capabilities. You know, I uh, uh, found a guy who was uh, um, talented in both areas, um, had a long history of sign making experience and was uh, extremely adept at, uh, at digital art making and graphics um, and uh, did his own personal kinds of things as well. So um, I've been very fortunate with him. Michael Ryan, your first employee, uh, production and graphic skills. Yeah, so he had enough design uh, experience to be dangerous. Uh, his real skill set is it was production um, and overall uh, management, um, real problem solver. Okay, and Mike Butler? Uh, my first guy could, could do it all. Could design, could run the equipment, could do a little installation, knew people in the industry, knew where to get stuff. It was, uh, it was really helpful. First hire is important. Okay, uh, Jack, first hire. First hire should be able to design it, to print it, to assemble it, to install it, carry it from concept to completion. Okay, Brian Kane. Brian, come off a of mute. Go ahead, Brian, Brian King. Okay, Brian, um, up in the top right-hand corner where your little box is, if you click on those arrows and take yourself off of mute. 
Tommaso, Tommaso, are you there? Come off a of mute. Or they can type in the chat window. Okay. Well, let's see. Hey, hey Ken, is it okay to ask a follow up? Uh, go ahead and type in in the chat and we'll come back around. Yeah, okay, I did. Okay. Um, all right, uh, the 314 area code, uh, is that Mike Butler? That's Mike, yeah. Okay, the 724 area code. Do you have a question? Come off a of mute. Got it. All right, let's take the questions in the chat box. Um, Brian Kane says he does not have any questions at the moment. Okay, so from Michael Moore. Oh, we talked that we oh, transition capability more specifically. So, ask my, Michael Ryan where did the other 30% of your new businesses, where's the other 30% of your new business? <laughs> Yeah, I responded in chat. Uh, it's referrals. Okay, got it. How did you find your first hire Craigslist? I think we answered them all. Jim Pershing, I think we answered the question, how long to uh, break even? What is your current, oh. Mike, uh, Jim Pershing, you want to come off a of mute and maybe sure. re ask that question? Sure, sure. Um, so, so my question is, you guys, it sounds like you guys have pro forma financials, so you have some sort of target uh, net margin or EBITDA. Oh, okay. All right. We talked about how long did it take to get to break even, but how long did it take to get to your target EBITDA? And just out of curiosity, what is your current Okay. profitability of your businesses. Mike, Mike Butler, in a percentage basis, what is your net profit, net cash flow to the owner? Um, what percent? 25 to 30%. Michael Ryan, what is your net cash flow to the owner? Net profit. Same, 25 to 30%. Steve Cap. I'm about 23%. Jack Werner. I was very consistent at 25%. Okay. Jim Pershing, did we answer your question? Yeah, and then how, how, how long did it take you to get so that you were able to operate at that level of profitability? Steve Cap, how long? Six months. Mike Butler? I'd say very quickly, a couple months. Michael Ryan? Yeah, just a few months. Jack Warner? Pretty typical. Okay, back to the chat. Um, Mike Lusky has a question to fill in the blank. If I had to do it all over again, I would what? If you had to do it all over again, what would you do, Mike Butler? Well, to steal from Jack Warner, I would say maybe do it a little earlier in my life. I, I, I would say uh, that would have, have been, been wise. From an operation standpoint, I would have, I would have uh, had a system in place to manage a huge volume of business and a number of projects. We weren't quite ready when the business came flowing in. Okay, Michael Ryan, fill in the blank. If I had it to do all over again, I would? I've done it a lot earlier. Steve Cap, if I had it to do all over again, I would have? Say, would have done it a little bit younger, more hair. Jack Werner? Well, follow the plan. You know, you can tweak it to your own style, but the system works. Uh, so I think most sign world owners, if you had to ask them doing it over again, what would you do? It would be follow the plan a little bit more. Sheree, go ahead. Next question. Anybody type in your question in the chat box. We still have about another uh, nine minutes to go. So if you have more questions, type them in in the chat box. Go ahead, Sheree. Okay. Kim Bai says, I believe I heard the average profit margin of 25% is that after the owner takes salary. That is everything that goes to the owner, the net cash flow, their salary, their bonus, their contribution to the pension plan, their car, their uh, perks, everything that falls to the owner is the net cash flow, net profit of the business. Ken, uh, if I can add to that, 
Also realize that most of the other options you're looking at are income producers, they're not equity builders. This is a business that you're gonna sell for a multiple of what you paid for it. Uh, you're gonna sell it for three to four times the net profit. So if you do the math of what these owners are doing and then multiply that out, they built a business that's worth multiple times of what they paid for it. We've already had single unit, one location resale, $3 million. We've had several at $2 million. So the money is there. The resale value is there. Go ahead, Sheree. Okay, from Brent Russ. What was your top reason for choosing to work with Sign World? Mike Butler, number one reason for joining Sign World. Oh, I'll give a couple business to business, uh, family friendly hours, um, and not a franchise in the common vernacular sound way french michael ryan why did you join sign world no rules no royalties and uh, i love the sign world family steve cap why did you join sign world two big reasons when i looked at all the other business opportunities out there sign world had the best return on revenue out of all of them and the other thing is it just appealed to me uh from a personal standpoint, creativity and things like that, that, uh, you know, I wanted to try and do something in my own. And uh, so it was, uh, it was a good fit. Jack Warner, why did you join Sign World? You know, I made a list of 35 things that were important for me. Some involved my daily life, some involved the economics, some involved life beyond the business. Everything else shown to me got booted out for one of several reasons. And Sign World hit all 35. It was the best decision I ever made. Sheree, go ahead. Michael Moore, how do you establish pricing and evaluate it if pricing is appropriate as the business matures? Jack, you want to start out with the training that we give them? We've got a very elaborate business management software system called CoreBridge. They're the largest provider in our industry. They've got thousands of users, and in, I think they're in 40 languages now. It'll do your CRM, your inventory control, your estimating, your invoicing, your project management, your production board, your credit card processing, your time clock, all then dropping into QuickBooks Pro for accounting purposes. It'll give you industry standard pricing, but again, you have complete control of that. So if you want to discount or embellish pricing, you're free to do it, but at least give you the standard of the industry and for you to take it from there. Steve Katt, do you use the CoreBridge pricing? Yeah, um, and uh, we've tweaked it uh, over time. Uh, as I found, you know, where the market sensitivities are and uh, to price. So, um, you know, you got to keep your ear to the grindstone and, and, and see how the market responds to your pricing. Michael Ryan, do you use your coverage pricing program? Uh, I use Shopbox, but uh, same, same concept. And we too have uh, tweaked pricing over time, just, uh, you know, understanding what our market will and will not bear. And Mike Butler? Uh, we use the old serious model, but I'll agree with what the other guys have all said. Just tweak it as we go. So a comment to that, over, over the years, we've had several different programs. Uh, serious that Mike Butler's on was bought out by Corbridge several years ago, then merging those together. Shopbox with another alternative several years ago. And over the last five years, it's been Corbridge and virtually all owners since then are on that. Bottom line though, more pricing training than you'll ever make time to go to. We have pricing training going on in <laughs> fashion every week of the year, at least one, if not two or three pricing classes to go to, to understand. Uh, sorry? Uh, from Dave, what was the biggest obstacle you faced starting up? Steve Cap, what was your biggest obstacle start up? Well, it was the biggest decision you make, which is getting your sign maker. Um, so, you know, making that uh, happen and, and doing it successfully, you know, just pays the path for you. Michael Ryan, biggest obstacle when you started up? I don't really consider it a big obstacle, but I had to get out and meet people and let them know I existed. Because you didn't know anybody in town. Exactly. Mike Butler, biggest obstacle in the beginning? I would say after we started uh, not not being ready for the volume and number of jobs that we had. So the avalanche. We had so much so much business. The avalanche buried you. 
Jack yeah. Werner? You know, I think it's figuring out where your strengths are, where your weaknesses are, and higher to that, and lean to sign rule than the rest of the family for supplement to those weaknesses. Okay. Shrey? From Jim, how do you cover your personal expenses until you can make money from the business? <laughs> I would recommend, yeah, I'd recommend what, what we recommend is that you set aside an amount of money, approximately a year's worth of living expenses to have your uh, a brand new business expect to make as much as you did in corporate life. First year in business is, is naive. So set aside approximately a year's worth uh, using the majority of that to supplement a modest year one, using some of it to supplement a better year two. And by that time, you should be back to corporate income. You're making money during that time, but it may not be equal to the, the the family bleed. Go ahead, Shrey. Um, there was a person, 480 um, area code. Do you have a question? I believe that's Brad. Uh, yeah, that's, that's me. That's Brian King. Oh, okay. Gotcha. I'm all set. Okay, perfect. Thank you so Thanks. much. Thanks, Brian. Okay, uh, Tommaso typed in his question. He says, if opening a center in a big metro area with urban sprawl can eventually be a concern too risky, hiring the first employee who lives not so close to the center. Okay, well, first of all, uh, all of our owners on the call today are in what I would call large urban sprawl areas. So Mike Butler, how far away is your, does your furthest living employee live from or commute? Uh, one of my installers lives about 35 miles away. He's got about a 40 mile, 45 minute drive to and from work and he times it right. He's, he's okay. Mike Butler, your longest commute employee? I think that you mean me, Ken. Ryan. Michael Ryan, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, uh, about 40 minutes. And Steve Cap, 30. Jack Werner? I had one that drove an hour and a half each way, and he wanted to come and work for me. There was a lot of competitors between where he lived and my operation, but uh, we treated him well. Okay. Go ahead, Shrey. Okay, I believe this is the last question uh, from James. Is the starting equipment package enough for production requirements in the first year, or do you need to supplement it in your first year? Is it top of the line equipment? Jack, you want to start out? You know, we're going to give you three pieces of equipment that we have beta tested to make sure that not only the latest and greatest, but the most reliable. So no matter where they're located, they're reliable. Uh, they should produce 75% of your sales. We then have a full roster of all the suppliers that will make everything else for you. So you're bringing in extra equipment is only for your need, desire to control it as opposed to relying on the others that are out there. Steve Cap, you've been in business how long now? A little bit over two years now. And do you still have your original startup package? <laughs> have you bought any I other do. substantial equipment? I do have all the, all the original equipment. Um, we've added uh, equipment as we've gone along. But uh, the core, the core of our business is still the the main stuff we bought from Sign World. And how much in dollars of add-on equipment have you spent in two years? Oh, nine o'clock. Uh, I'd say probably about one hundred twenty-five thousand dollars. And okay. Steve is an exception. Hmm. Michael, I'm an exception. You have a startup package of equipment, and have you bought anything else? I still have the original startup package, uh, still running like a champ. I have not bought anything else outside of, you know, some tools and equipment for installations and things like that. Uh, in five and a half years. Five and a half. Mike Butler, 10 years, uh, startup package, bought anything else? Uh, no, I still have basically the same, same stuff. I've swapped it out, but uh, I've added uh, installation uh, supply tools and equipment and but other than that, what you get is plenty for you to get going. Okay, so let's go back to Steve Cap. You've added some more equipment. Must be a specific reason, Steve, you want to explain? Well, um, like I said, when I, uh, about six months in, I bought another sign making business and uh, I uh, bought into um, uh, some equipment, laser uh, cutters specifically, 
I bought some substrate cutters, uh, other shop equipment uh, right. for manufacturing. Um, so we've uh, we've gone a lot more towards the in-house manufacturing than what we do um, when we first started. We did almost everything outsourced and and brought a lot of it in-house. So this is a result of buying another sign company. Yeah. Okay, uh, Sheree, are we? Uh, one more question from Brent. What percent of your business is vehicle wrap? And then what percent is digital signage? Okay. Uh, overall vehicles are about 25% of the business. Uh, Steve Cap, what percent of your business are vehicles? Yeah, I'd say it's probably about, uh, about 17 to 20%. And uh, let's define digital. Digital meaning signage that plays on a monitor that looks like a TV set is what we would define as digital. What percent of your business, Steve Cap, is digital? So we're just starting to get into that digital LED sign panel stuff. In fact, we just did a job uh, last week. Uh, it was a $30,000 job. Um, and it's going to become a bigger part of our business as we grow. And Mike Butler, what percent of your business is vehicle wraps? What percent digital? Uh, vehicles are maybe 4%, four, four percent, something like that. Uh, digital, maybe 5 to five to eight percent michael ryan yeah uh vehicle wraps are probably five to ten percent of my business um mm -hmm. and then digital signage we do we've done only a couple projects because they've outlawed a lot of those in our uh municipalities around here okay we're the bottom line is there are so many niches to this business that you can make a great living in any one of the niches or avoid it and be perfectly fine either way. Okay. I think we're out of, bit, out of time. Uh, Jack, you want to close it out? Well, I will. You know, first off, for, for Steve, Mike, and Michael, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy days. We know you guys are, are busy. I do want to ask you one last question. Nobody asked. So while we had a bit of a, a hiccup with uh, the COVID and when businesses were shut down, but Imagine all of you were still operating during that time, and what's it like coming out of it? Uh, what's your, your lead flow right now? Are, are you scared about the world and the environment, or is it all hands on deck, let's go? Uh, Steve, you're the youngest guy. Uh, yeah, it's all hands on deck. Uh, we're, we're drinking from the fire hose right at the moment. We're nose down and focusing on the business. And Michael? Yeah, we actually did shut down for about five weeks in this area, but um, it's business as usual. I mean, we, we've got all we can handle right now. Mike Butler? We're slammed and going to be slammed. Well, thank you guys for taking time out of your busy days. For those of you that are more interested in, in this, go back to Ken, to Dan, to myself. Uh, we'll have another webinar just like this uh, three weeks from today on Wednesday. Uh, Sheree, do you have that date in front of you? I apologize. Wednesday, July 1st. Very good. So have a great day. Stay safe. Uh, look forward to hearing more from you. And, and let's continue to investigate and see if this makes sense for all of us. Thank you all.